Samuel anoints Saul to be king in 1 Samuel. Then Saul, uh, after about a year or two of decent reigning, uh, as far as he's reigning well, probably the first year, after that he gets lifted up with pride, doesn't need God anymore, starts doing his own thing. For about the next 38 to 39 years, it's awful. And he reigned a total of 40 years. Because of that, God told Samuel, go, go rent, tell him the, the kingdom's going to be rent out of your hand and anoint David. So Samuel anoints the first two kings. And David is anointed king. He doesn't become king automatically. If you'll remember all the stories, Saul chases David down. David won't touch him because Saul is anointed and all those things. Saul is killed in battle. Uh, David hears about it in 2 Samuel chapter 1. And that's why 2 Samuel all about David and his reign. And, I mean, it's a, just a real picture of, the, of, of Jesus and his reigning and, and the fact that the, the throne of David will be solidified uh, and Jesus will sit on, upon the throne of David. David has several children, several sons, but one of them reigns. David chooses Solomon to reign. Now, even all that was contested. There was a son that, that rose up and wanted to be anointed king. Solomon later on wound up killing him. Uh, so Solomon becomes king. Solomon is the son of Bathsheba, whom, you know, the, the, main, the major sin of David's life was adultery with Bathsheba and then murdering her husband, Uriah. God killed their first son as punishment for that, for that sin. And even said, you know, uh, you're going to pay fourfold. David wound up paying fourfold. He, he wound up losing at least four sons to, to murder. And so, including the one Solomon killed. So, you know, it, it, his sin really did come back to, to haunt him there. But Solomon, God brought good out of bad. And Solomon is a picture of that. And, and Solomon reigns in David's stead. And this is, these are the only three kings that ever reign over a united Israel. That's it. It's the first three kings. They each reigned 40 years. So the first 120 years of Israel's nationhood, really, as far as being underneath a king, uh, uh, had, had a united, they only had three kings and it was united. Solomon, in 1 Kings chapter number 11, and you can go ahead and turn there, Solomon gets into, well, he, he kind of copies the sin of his dad. He takes it a little further. David had multiple wives. I know of at least 17 women that the Bible mentions that David had. Ten of them were concubines, which are basically uh, you're not quite married to them. Okay? They're basically uh, full-time prostitutes, for lack of a better way to describe that. They live in the house and stuff like that. David had ten of them that his son Absalom uh, raped on the rooftop in front of everybody. So there's at least ten there. He had seven wives uh, that, that, that are mentioned in the Scripture. So David had at least seven, 17 women, probably more. Solomon takes that sin and goes way further with that. Solomon has 1,000 women. Uh, if I remember correctly, uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't read it, but it's, it's either 300 wives and 700 concubines or 700 wives and 300. I think it's 300 wives and 700 concubines. Um, you say, wow, how did he get into that mess? Well, that's how thorough David's reign was. That's how blessed the nation of Israel was. They were so powerful on the planet at that time. King David had become so powerful. Honestly, the next king was so powerful, he could, he could afford to have a thousand wives. It, it wasn't a good idea. It's not one of those things he needed to do. It's just that's how powerful he was. He could do that and get away with it. It just speaks to the power of the, of the throne of David at that time. But God was not pleased with this. He was not pleased with how it was going. Um, the thousand women that Solomon wound up getting involved with weren't godly women, and they wound up leading his heart astray. They got him into, into idolatry, and that's what chapter 11 is about. It says in verse number 1, But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh. So he had an Egyptian wife. Uh, do you know anything about the Egyptian religions? 
uh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites. And see, all those women are bringing their religion into this marriage, into this union, and into this relationship. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after, after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love, and he had seven, there it is, 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. That's the key thing to remember. They turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after, his, after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, He was uh, as was the heart of David his father. Uh, it goes on and explains, uh, in verse number 9, The Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice, and had commanded him concerning this thing. But he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Uh, Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servant. Notwithstanding in thy days I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. Howbeit I will not rend away all the kingdom, but will give one tribe to thy son for David my servant's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. And, and those were the, the those were the three verses I studied when I was studying this out was verses 11 through 13 because that's the important thing to, to remember in 1 Kings. Right off the bat, the last king where everything's united, God tells him, I'm about to tear the kingdom from you. I'm going to leave you one tribe, Judah. And I, and I believe, if I remember correctly in the details, Manasseh and Benjamin, partial parts of their tribes are included in it too. They decide to stick with David's throne. But the rest of them go with a guy named Jeroboam. Jeroboam. That's going to be the next one. So Solomon's kingdom is torn and Jeroboam becomes the next king of, of ten tribes. Solomon's son, I'll do a different color for this son, is Rehoboam. And this is why people right off the bat studying kings start getting confused because these two names sound so similar. The only difference in the two names is the first letter. Rehoboam is Solomon's son. So David's throne keeps going through this side. Rehoboam reigns over the biggest tribe, Judah, and part of the tribe of Manasseh, and I believe the tribe of Benjamin. The rest of Manasseh and the other tribes go with Jeroboam. Jeroboam, <coughs> see, Solomon had gotten sinful, and so God did this because of Solomon's sin. So you would think Jeroboam would go, you know what, I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to be serious about serving the Lord. Uh, I saw what happened to Solomon and Rehoboam, so uh, I'm going to be serious about this. Not at all. Not at all. Uh, let me see. What... Yeah, turn to chapter number 12 and verse 25. Instead of realizing, wow, I should really serve the Lord, I should be serious about this, Jeroboam invents a religion. Instead of serving the one true God who has this kind of power that can, you know, give you ten tribes. And by the way, just, you know, there's a story in here, we're, we're not going into it for the sake of time, but a prophet came to Jeroboam in the middle of a field and told him this was going to happen. A prophet of the Lord told him that. So you would think, okay, so the Lord said this is going to happen, I should start serving him. Not at all. Uh, chapter 12, verse 25. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim, and dwelt therein, and went out from thence, and built Penuel. And look at what Jeroboam says in his heart, verse 26. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. He's worried that the kingdom will be united again under David's throne. 
If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord. Now, who built the house of the Lord at Jerusalem? Solomon did. David got all the stuff together. But you know what Jeroboam's worried about? He's worried about the people having a religious revival and getting right with God and going back to the temple that Solomon had built in Jerusalem. That's what he's worried about. Not a very good thing to be worried about, is it? In fact, his attitude ought to be, you know what, if that's what happens, then so be it. Bless the Lord. The Lord gave me this power in the first place, so, you know, if that's what the Lord wants to happen, that should be his attitude. But that's not his attitude. He, said, he says, They shall turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. This, this uh, sounds a lot like Aaron, you know, making the, the, the calf of gold. And said unto them, It is too much for you to go to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Same thing Aaron said. The very, it's the very same religion. And he set the one in Bethel, house of God, and the other put he in Dan. And so he, he invented, a, he, he uh, basically reinstated an old religion and had the people doing this. He said it's too hard. Listen, is any religion going to work? Is just any, any doctrine going to fly with God? No. So this is absolutely silly. He's basically going, look, I know people are religious and they really need a really good religion, so I'm going to give them this. And that's the thought of the king. And it's absolutely uh, crazy. Well, Jeroboam gets into all this stuff, and uh, uh, it's, it's, there's a, a prophet comes and talks to him in chapter 14. Ahijah uh, comes and talks to him and, and basically says, Hey, look, because you're doing these sacrifices up here to your, to your golden calves, a, a, a king, he names him Josiah is going to burn the priest's bones on those very altars. And later on, the last king of Judah winds up keeping that prophecy that's given in chapter number 14, King Josiah. Uh, let's see, what did I have next in my notes? Jeroboam. Look at chapter number 15, verse number 1. Well... I tell you what, look at, look at chapter 14 and verse 21. We've got to do that one first. Here's where the book of Kings starts giving you summaries of these guys' reigns. Look at chapter 14, verse 21. And Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 40 and 1 years old when he began to reign. So this is Rehoboam. He was 41 when he began to reign, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord did choose out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Nama the Ammonitess. Uh, and Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy and their sins, which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. For they also built high places and images and groves on every high hill, and under every green tree. And there were also Sodomites in the land, and they did according to the all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. So you get a summary of Rehoboam's reign, the next 17 years. So he died when he was 58. You can actually get really thorough on all these ages and how, how long uh, each uh, these reigns last. You can get pretty thorough uh, in your study of it if you want, if you're interested in that sort of thing. But... Rehoboam's reign is wicked. Jeroboam invents a wicked religion. It's not looking too good. After, well, Saul had a, a good year or two, but David has a good reign. Solomon has a decent reign. He got pretty, he got kind of mean to the people at the end, but now it's looking awful. Now, how's your political situation looking today? <laughs> we think it's new. It's not, there's nothing new. Uh, the politics of their day was was just absolutely atrocious. Uh, which okay, think I mean we've got an election coming up. What two weeks? I didn't realize two or three weeks it snuck up on me. Uh, you know, it's kind of choosing the lesser of two evils. I mean, which one would you have voted for? 
golden calf guy or wicked guy that lets all the sodomites in the land and all that kind of stuff. I mean, oh, it's just your decisions, your choices aren't, aren't very good. And it, it's the same thing for Israel at that time. Uh, chapter 15, verse number 1. Now in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, reigned Abijam over Judah. Three years reigned he in Jerusalem. So Rehoboam reigned 17. Abijah, his son, Abijam, his son, reigns three years. And his mother's name was Makkah, the daughter of Abishalom. And look at this, verse 3. And he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as the heart of David his father. Nevertheless, for David's sake, did the Lord his God give him a lamp in Jerusalem to set up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem, because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord and turned not aside from anything that he had commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. And so, in other words, God is saying, look, the next ruler here, Abijam, is wicked. But I'm not going to do away with his throne for David's sake. And Abijam only reigns three years. That's why it throws in there what year uh, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, is in. See, they're doing that for chronology. They're telling you which year. So Jeroboam is still king when Abijam becomes king. Okay? That's the only reason it's throwing those details in there. Don't get hung up too much on the details. Look at verse number 9. And in the twentieth year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, reigned Asa over Judah. And forty and one years reigned he in Jerusalem. So now he's the longest reigning king. Longer even than the first three. Asa will reign forty-one years. And his mother's name was Makkah, the daughter of Abishalom. And Asa, listen to this, Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. So... It says in verse number 12, we'll go into a little more detail. And he took away the Sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols and his fa uh, that his fathers had made. And also Makkah, his mother, he also put her away. Apparently a pretty wicked uh, woman. Uh, removed from being queen because she had made an idol in a grove. And Asa destroyed her idol and burnt it by the brook Kydron. But the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was perfect with the Lord all his days. Uh, and he brought in the things which his father had dedicated and the things which he himself had dedicated into the house of the Lord, silver and gold and vessels. And so you get a, a summary of Asa's reign. Uh, Asa was a good king. We call him a, a good king. I'm going to give them a different color. Because there's not very many of them. <laughs> Asa is a good king. Now all this is happening while Jeroboam is still on the throne of Israel. All of this. That's, that's where this can get confusing. People, it's not necessarily in chron it is a little bit in chronological order, but sometimes it skips ahead. It, it'll give you a summary. Like right there, we just got a summary of 41 years in five verses. We got a summary of what he did. Now later on, Asa turns his heart away from God at the end of his life. Uh, God gives him a disease in his feet for two years, but he wouldn't seek the Lord on it, and he finally died of it. But overall, it's giving you an overall summary of his life. Overall, he was a good king. Overall, he was a godly man. It's kind of like, I mean, any, any, any person that ever serves the Lord, any person that ever walks with the Lord, what are we going to have to say? Now, they had some blemishes. Uh, they had some, but they, they were godly. They loved the Lord. Uh, they were walking with Him. They had a good walk with the Lord. Are we not going to say that about any solid Christian. Is that not what's going to... We're going to make an observation. It's the ones that we didn't see a lot of difference in their life that worries us. You know, there's, it's the ones that never made a profession of faith. Those are the ones that cause us worry. Asa was a saved man who served the Lord. Had some issues later on, but he served the Lord. Look at uh, verse number 25. And Nadab, the son of Jeroboam, began to reign over Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah. And he reigned over Israel two years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and in his sin wherewith he made Israel to sin. So in other words, 
he was full blown into the golden calf religion. That's the sin which he made Israel to sin. That's what that's referring to. Nadab. Alright. He reigned two years. That's a pretty short reign. Uh, look at uh, verse number 33. In the third year of Asa, king of Judah, began Basha, the son of Ahijah, to reign over all Israel in Terza twenty and four years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of Jeroboam, that first guy, and in his sin wherewith he made Israel to sin. That's why I shared that chapter with you. That's a common theme throughout this whole book. It always says that. The kings of Israel. It's always, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of Jeroboam and in his sin wherewith he made Israel to sin. So it always goes back to that. So this one is Basha. He's reigning over Israel. Uh, it goes on and has a prophecy against Basha here, but uh, uh, look at chapter 16, verse 8. In the twenty and sixth year of Asa, king of Judah, began Elah, the son of Basha, to reign over Israel in Terza, two years. Okay, so Elah begins to reign. All of this is happening, by the way, these, these two and this next one, Elah, while Asa is still king. So this is Elah, and he reigns two years. Elah is brutally murdered. His, his end isn't so good. It says in verse number 9, And his servant Zimri, captain of half his chariots, conspired against him, and he was in Terza, drinking himself drunk in the house of Arza. Elah was getting drunk in the house of Arza, steward of his house in Terza. And Zimri went in and smote him and killed him. And in the twenty and seventh year of Asa king of Judah and reigned in his stead. So Zimri stole the throne of Israel. All right? So now we have Zimri reigning. <laughs> we need to just leave the lid off. Now we have Zimri. Zimri isn't a king's son or anything like that. He was a, he's an army general, captain of half of his host. That means cap general of half of his army. Okay. So it says in, in verse 15, In the twenty and seventh year of Asa king of Judah did Zimri reign seven days. He only reigned seven days. It's not seven years. In Terza, and the people were encamped against Gibbethon, uh, which belonged to the Philistines, now, when the people heard all of this, I'm going to summarize. When the people heard all this had happened, they made Omri, I guess the captain of the other half of the army, they made Omri king. Zimri and Omri. I, I, those are my next two child names. Zimri and Omri. So when they did this, uh, Omri took the other half of the army and went and besieged the city. Now look at what uh, verse 18 says. And it came to pass when Zimri saw that the city was taken, that he went into the palace of the king's house and burnt the king's house over him with fire and died. He committed suicide by fire. Wouldn't that be brutal? That would be, that would be an awful way to die. It seems like you'd figure out a better way to do it. But he went and burnt the whole house down over him. It says in verse 19, For his sins which he sinned in doing evil in the sight of the Lord, in, look at this, in walking in the way of Jeroboam, and in his sin which he did to make Israel to sin. Boy, that just keeps coming up, doesn't it? Over and over. Now it says in verse 21, Then were the people of Israel divided in two parts. Uh, the people, uh, <clears throat> verse 22, But the people that followed Omri prevailed against the people that followed Tibni, the son of Ganath, so Tibni died and Omri reigned. In the thirty and first year of Asa, king of Judah, began Omri to reign over Israel twelve years. Six years reigned he in Terza, 
And he bought the hill Samaria of Shimmer. Uh, and goes on and talks about that. It says in verse 25, But Omri wrought evil in the eyes of the Lord and did worse than all that were before him. For he walked in all the way of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, and in his sin wherewith he made Israel to sin, to provoke the Lord God to, of Israel to anger with their vanities. And so it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse in this false religion of Jeroboam. And Omri was pretty bad. It says in verse 29, now look at how bad this gets. And in the 30th and 8th year of Asa, so Asa is still reigning over here in Judah. Okay, you following? In the 30th and 8th year, he reigned 41 years. So he's an old man by now. He's, he's getting to the end of his reign. 30th and 8th year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel and Samaria 20 and 2 years. Now, has it gotten better? Do you know Ahab? It just keeps getting better and better, don't it? <laughs> it's getting worse and worse. And people think, I mean, take, take the scientific realm. People think the human race is getting better and better and better. I think we're getting worse and worse and worse. I really do. I think, we've, I think we figure some things out. I think our intelligence rises and all that. But we're not getting more spiritual. We're not getting more moral. Uh, we keep repeating the same sins over and over. We tend to get, we, we keep getting worse and worse. Honestly, take America, for example, and, and, and their leaders. I don't, I don't think you do better than George Washington. I really don't. I mean, I've just been convinced of it. The guy was just, he was a good man. He was a really good man. He really cared about everybody. If he didn't, he would have become king. He really would have. And, and he had all the power to do so. He put down a rebellion right after the revolution. Uh, his, his soldiers were going to rebel because they hadn't been paid the whole time of the, of, the, of the revolution. They hadn't been paid. And he came in there and put down a whole rebellion just by talking to them. Uh, uh, you might look it up. <clears throat> he, uh, he did it on purpose. He pulled out some glasses and put them on. None of them had ever seen him wear glasses before. And he said, I've grown old in service to my country. And he was... And, said there wasn't a dry eye in the place because he broke their hearts and they, they put down their weapons and weren't going to rebel. After Washington, uh, there's some pretty good guys. Uh, Jefferson was okay. Uh, you know, but there's this kind of steady decline down. And if you read history books of today, you'll find uh, they'll make Franklin Delano Roosevelt out to, make, uh, out to be like a, just a wonderful hero. And he, he made some good decisions in World War II. I'm not taking that away. But he had some awful programs. Awful government programs that are still affecting us today. They're still going on. Our Social Security issues started with him. Uh, there was no need for a lot of that stuff. So, anyway, you get into all this. We're not getting better. We're not getting better. I, I made this, this uh, comment when Obama and Trump... Now, Obama and Romney were running against each other. Romney is a Mormon. Romney's vice president candidate was Paul Ryan, who's a Catholic. And really, those were the two conservative choices, as opposed to, to Obama, which I'm not sure what he is. I'm not sure what his religion is. He says he's Christian. I hope he is. I really do. I haven't, I haven't seen the fruit of it. But anyhow... Uh, all that, and I'm going, wow, what a choice. The Mormons used to be illegal in America. They were kicked out. That's why they wound up in Utah, because they were murderers and thieves. They stole people's women. <laughs> uh, Joseph Smith was an absolute crazy lunatic who was murdered in Missouri because he tried to steal some things from some, from some other families. He taught that it was okay to steal from infidels, and anybody's an infidel if you're not a Mormon. That's what he taught. Uh, and he wound up getting killed. That's why on the Oregon Trail, when, when people would go through Utah, if they were from Missouri, uh, the Mormons would kill them. It's, it's called the, uh, there's a book written called the, the how is it, the, uh, I can't even remember, the, uh, uh, it's basically the uncomfortable history of the Mormon church. <laughs> the uncomfortable history. Yeah, and I, I was sitting there going, wow, Romney's a Mormon. Paul Ryan's a Catholic. Do you know it used to be illegal for Catholics to run for office when America first became a nation? Because the whole taxation without representation thing, 
Protestant denominations were tired of paying taxes to the Church of England, which was Catholic. They made it illegal in most states to run for office. If you're, you had to be Protestant or something close to that to run for office. I'm not saying, listen, you can, you can look at history and go, wow, a lot of that's mean or whatever. No, I'm just saying our country has not gotten better spiritually. Back then, people knew what they believed and they knew why they believed it. They knew, they knew uh, exactly what they were doing. And uh, listen, we haven't gotten better. And when you look at the nation of Israel, you don't see this great spiritual... No, you see a spiritual decline. Asa did some reforms. He got rid of you know, some things out of the nation. Let me see who's next after Asa. Uh, chapter 22. Chapter 22. We have another good king mentioned. Verse number 41. Jehoshaphat. One of my favorite kings. I really like Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat's great weakness, though, was that he got along with Ahab. That was his great weakness. It says in, in verse 41, And Jehoshaphat, the son of Asa, began to reign over Judah in the fourth year of Ahab, king of Israel. Jehoshaphat was 30 and 5 years old when he began to reign. Wow, I'm 35. Anyway. And he reigned 20 and 5 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Azubah, the daughter of Shilhai. And he walked in all the ways of Asa, his father. He turned not aside from it doing that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. Now that's quite a compliment. Praise the Lord for, for Jehoshaphat and his testimony. Because we haven't been reading many of those, have we? We've been reading about wicked kings of Israel, haven't we? Walking the ways of Jeroboam. Nevertheless, the high places were not taken away, for the people offered and burnt incense yet in the high places. Look at this in verse 44. And Jehoshaphat made peace with the king of Israel which is Ahab. And him and Ahab got along real good. They had a buddy system. It says in verse 50, And Jehoshaphat slept with his fathers, that means he died, and was buried with his fathers in the city of David his father. And Jehoram his son reigned in his stead. So the very next one is Jehoram. And, I'm, and here's a spoiler alert. Jehoram is wicked. This is where it will get really confusing because Jehoram, there's also a Jehoram over here <laughs> in the kings of Israel right around the same time. Now it says in verse 51, Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel in Samaria, the 17th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. He reigned two years over Israel and he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and in the way of his mother and in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. For he served Baal and worshipped him and provoked to anger the Lord God of Israel according to all that his father had done. Oh yeah, that's the other thing. Ahab took Jeroboam's religion a step further, married a woman named Jezebel, which basically, I believe, means servant of Baal, is what her name literally means. And he started worshipping Baal. So he led them into an even more wicked, sinful religion. Uh, Baal worship has a lot to do with sexuality and all sorts of things like that, it gets pretty bad. It's a, it's a fertility religion. So it was even worse than the golden calf stuff. So you can just see the religious decline of Israel. And what was his? Ahaziah. Ahaziah was his name. I'm going to put it up here just so we can see it. Ahaziah. Ahaziah. Okay. Next, we're going to... And get into Second Kings for just a minute, and let me look at who who we got coming up next. Ahaziah, Second Kings chapter number one. It, yeah, I think I think I got one verse to read there. Yeah, verse number seventeen. Uh, all of chapter one is about Ahaziah. Ahaziah took a bad fall through a rooftop. He was dying. He sent to. Uh, Elijah to find out what he needed to do and uh, Elijah basically said you're going to die. 
And in verse number 17, it says, So he died. That's Ahaziah. So he died according to the word of the Lord which Elijah had spoken. And Jehoram reigned in his stead. Who? Jehoram? Different Jehoram. This is where it gets confusing, okay? It's not the same guy. It's not the same guy. Ahaziah had a, a brother. It's not a son. A brother named Jehoram. So Ahab had a son named Jehoram. <coughs> Who did Jehoshaphat name his son after? Named him after Ahab's son. You, aimed, you named your son after a wicked man. Jehoram reigns in Ahaziah's stead. Let me put that up here. Jehoram. Uh, Chronicles points out that Jehoshaphat and Ahab had joined affinity. In other words, they started getting along real good. Uh, too good. Let's see. Chapter number 9, I believe, is next. Yes, chapter 9 and, and 17. I'm skipping over a bunch because now it starts talking about Elisha. Remember I was telling you that? Uh, the end of 1 Kings is Elijah. The beginning of 2 Kings is all Elisha. So now we'll get back into the Kings. Uh, chapter number 9 and uh, verse 23. Okay, yeah. Let's see, Joram turned. I've, I've skipped one, but here, let me, uh, let me fix that. I think I skipped. Yes, I did. Chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 8, verse 25. Here we go. I apologize. Ahaziah says in verse 25, In the twelfth year of Joram, the son of Ahab. Right here. That's shortened. That Joram is shortened. Jehoram, okay? In the twelfth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, did Ahaziah, this guy, no. Jehoram has a son named Ahaziah. You see why this gets confusing? Uh, did Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah. See, that's, see, what side is this over here? This is Judah. Jehoram, the king of Judah. This is Israel over here. This is the other ten tribes. Jehoram, the king of Judah, began to reign. Two and twenty-two years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign. And he reigned one year in Jerusalem... His mother's name was Athaliah. Remember her. She's going to be the next ruler. His mother's name was Athaliah, the daughter of Omri, king of Israel. Oh. Remember Omri? The dad of Ahab? So, the, the sister of Ahab is going to take over the throne of Judah. Put that together. Isn't that awful? Yeah. Okay, so... I gotta remember, let's see. Yeah, Ahaziah. Ahaziah. He reigns for one year. Now what happens in chapter number nine, beginning in verse number twenty-three, and Joram, that's this one, Israel's king. Joram turned his hands and fled and said to Ahaziah, that's this one. Judah's king. There is treachery, O Ahaziah. And Jehu drew a bow with his full strength and smote Jehoram between his arms and the arrow went out at his heart and he sunk down in his chariot and died. Okay. It says in verse 27, But when Ahaziah, the king of Judah, saw this, he fled by the way of the garden house. And Jehu followed after him and said, Smite him also in, in the chariot. And they did so at the going up to Gur, which is by Iblium. Both of these men are basically killed by the same guy, Jehu. He also kills Jezebel. This is the guy that rides up and says, uh, Throw down her, if you're with me, throw her down. And let the dogs lick her blood. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't believe he said that, but... Uh, you can blame Brother Tommy O'Dell for that because he's got a song about letting the dogs lick up her blood. But anyway, <laughs> both of these men are killed by the same guy. Uh, Ahab has 70 sons who are beheaded in chapter number 10. Uh, 
Jehu kills 70 of Ahab's sons. He kills 42 of Ahaziah's brethren. This guy goes on a pretty murderous reign. You think Jehu's doing some good. You think he's cleansing the land, right? It says in chapter 10, verse 31, look at Jehu. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord. <laughs> this guy's just killed two kings. He's killed Jezebel, the queen of Israel. He's killed 70 sons of Ahab. He's killed 42 brothers of Ahaziah. And all of that, God has let him do. And he doesn't think it's important to serve the Lord God. Wow, what does it take to wake some people up? Elisha had anointed this guy to do this. Lord God of Israel, with all his heart, for he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam. It goes all the way back here. Which made Israel to sin. In those days, the Lord began to cut Israel short, and Haziel smote them in all the coasts of Israel. Verse 36, And the time that Jehu reigned over Israel in Samaria was twenty and eight years. And so Jehu is the next king. And he was an evil one. You do not find a good king of Israel. It isn't in there. Only good kings of Judah. The ones who are actually serving the, the one true God. Now what happens here after Ahaziah dies, Athaliah, we mentioned her, the daughter of Ahab, because Jehoshaphat decided to let Jehoram marry the daughter of Ahab. Really bad idea. Athaliah basically has all of Ahaziah's uh, brothers, if I remember correctly, but all of his children uh, killed. Let me see, let me read it so I don't mess it up. It's a lot to remember. Uh, Athaliah. Oh, let me see. Okay, yeah. Look at chapter 11, verse number 1. And when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal. So she killed everybody that had a claim to the throne. Whether you were brothers of the king, uh, sons of the king, she had everybody killed. Man, things get brutal. But then it talks about a lady named Jehosheba uh, who hid a young boy. And it says in, uh, let me go ahead and write Athaliah. <clears throat> Chapter 12, verse 1. In the seventh year of Jehu, Jehoash began to reign, and forty years reigned he in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Zebiah of Beersheba. And Jehoash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. See that? All his days wherein Jehoiada the priest instructed him. So he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all the days that Jehoiada was alive. Now that's important. Uh, how did the Jehoash? So they finally have another good king. And the key there is Jehoiada, the high priest. He was a good man. He was a good godly man. And when he died, Jehoash decided to go wicked again. Now the Bible also calls him Joash. That's another name for him. A lot of times they'll take the J-E off and Call him that, but uh, but but Jehoash overall, the Bible summarizes, was a good king. Uh, then it goes on in chapter thirteen, uh, verse number one. In, in the three and twentieth year of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoaz, the son of Jehu, began to reign over Israel. And so now we have another king in Israel. Uh, he reigned seventeen years, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. See, it's not. <laughs> Still don't have a good king. Je, uh, Jehoaz, the son of Jehu, was wicked. 
It goes on in, in verse number 10, And in the thirty and seventh year of jo Joash, king of Judah, began Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, to reign over Israel and Samaria, and reigned sixteen years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. So there's two more kings over here. I'm not going to write them for the sake of time. Two more. Both of them evil. Both of them wicked. See, that's not me looking at their life and going, I think that person... No, that's what the Lord said. They were wicked. Now, that's not a Christian being judgmental. That's God going, no, those dudes were wicked. Those guys, That's the Holy Spirit of God pointing this out. And, and most people believe that Jeremiah the prophet wrote 1 and 2 Kings to explain to the people why they were going into captivity. Are you seeing why they're going into captivity? Just on the coloration alone. Judah winds up having, if I remember correctly, uh, either, and I don't remember if I added this up, including these three, that's why my numbers are off, but they may have had 17 to 20 kings. I can't remember the exact number. Eight of them are good. Only eight by the time you, you finish your list. Only eight. Um, I'm glad, I mean, Je Jehoshaphat was a good king, but he messed up. He, he got along with Ahab too well. Jehoram goes wicked. Ahaz Ahaziah goes wicked. Athaliah goes wicked. But Joash gets preserved. It goes on. Uh, uh, look at chapter 14, <clears throat> verse number 1. In the second year of Joash, uh, son of Jehoahaz, king of Israel, reigned Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah. So see, there's two Joashes. There's a Joash king of Israel and Joash king of Judah. He was 20 and 5 years old when he began to reign and reigned 20 and 9 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jehoadan of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. I love reading that. I'm glad I'm not reading he did that which was evil or that which was wicked. So Joash's son turns out pretty good. Amaziah is his name. Uh, it goes on. Chapter 15, verse 1, in the twenty and seventh year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, oh yeah, there's another Jeroboam later on, began Azariah, the son of uh, Amaziah, king of Judah, to reign. Sixteen years old uh, was he when he began to reign. It says in verse 3, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. So there's another good king right there, uh, Azariah, the son of Amaziah. So they have three, three good kings in a row. Uh, then it starts talking about some really wicked kings of Israel just before they go into bondage. Uh, verse 32 of chapter 15. In the second year of Pekah, the son of Ramalia, king of Israel, began Jotham, the son of Uzziah. Uh, you, Azariah, uh, I mentioned him a minute ago. We read about him in the first part. Of Uzziah is his other name. Now this is the guy who thought he would do the priestly thing and got struck with leprosy. He was a good king. Uzziah was a good king, but he had a sin, a pretty big one in his, during his reign, and God struck him with le leprosy. Let me point this out too. We're reading about all these good kings and then bad things happen to them. A lot of people think that living the Christian life, everything, everything's just going to go perfectly smooth. No. Sometimes you mess up big and God has to hit you with something. So you know, That's just ha how, how it goes. But it says uh, in verse 34 that this king did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. This, the one after uh, Uzziah did that which was right. It goes on, I think, he, I think Hezekiah is the next one. Uh, Hezekiah was a good king, if you'll remember correctly. He had an absolute wicked son named Manasseh who led the people into absolute wickedness. Now we're talking about King Manasseh of Judah. Manasseh burned his own children. Okay, absolute. He got them into a... a, a a false religion of Moloch, and Moloch required the, the human sacrifice of your own children. Uh, so Manasseh, then the last king of Judah is the last good king, and, and his name is Josiah. And so you have... Do you see why Israel went into bondage? Is it pretty clear? Mom, just so you, you just joined us, these are the good kings. Mm -hmm. And then there's... I, I didn't have enough room for all... But the wicked kings tend to really outnumber when a nation falls away from God uh, it's pretty clear what's going to happen to them Jeremiah was writing 1st and 2nd Kings to show the people this is why we're in bondage 
This is why. You know, all your false religions, all the false junk you've got into, the, the, the human sacrifice, the worshiping the golden calves, all that junk. And, and Jeremiah's pointing to pointing it out. It's your false religions. It's your idolatry. You've gotten away from God, and that's why we're going into bondage. The thing I want to ask you this morning to leave you with this thought. When it's all said and done, and, and say someone's reading it at your funeral, what are they going to say? King Asa reigned 41 years, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Uh, I want them to say, Brother Joseph lived 112 years. <laughs> no, I want them to say, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Boy, he had some mistakes. Asa made some mistakes. Jehoshaphat made some mistakes. Uh, King David made some mistakes. Solomon made some mistakes. All these, I mean, Solomon wrote three or four, let's see, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, some of your Psalms. He had some mistakes, didn't he, though? David wrote most of our Psalms. Asa was a good king, but he got wicked, he kind of got, he got rebellious, and he got cantankerous. Maybe that's a better word for it. In the end of his life, Jehoshaphat uh, did really good things, but he had a really bad best friend. Jehoash, Hezekiah did some good things. But, you know, you can always, you can always point... I want, I want him to say at the end of my journey, he walked with the Lord. He made some mistakes, he, you know, but he walked with the Lord. I want that to be able to be said. How about us? When you're reading through Kings, that's the predominant uh, theme. This king did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. This king did that which was right. What do we know to be right? If a person is lost, they need to get saved. That's what makes them right in the sight of the Lord. Receiving Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And then Christian walking with the Lord, we can then we, we can see the difference. We can see that they're walking with the Lord. I want it to be said of me when, at the end of my days. Uh, I don't just pause and think about that this morning as we conclude this this lesson on the kings. And remember this: one day when America falls, there's reasons. God has real reasons for what He's doing. Okay, it, I'm surprised he didn't stop it earlier. I'm surprised he hadn't stopped. I'm surprised he hadn't stopped everything earlier. But he's patient. He's long suffering. Uh, he cares about people. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come under repentance. And let's keep that in mind. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the books of First and Second Kings, Lord. And I, I know this was a long lesson. A a a. a, a uh, a more lengthy lesson, Lord, but we had a lot of material to cover. Lord, I, I pray that you just help us to stop, each and every one of us, to stop today and think about where we are in our lives. Help it to matter to us, uh, what you think of us. That We don't want to have evil in your sight. We don't want to do that which was, is evil in the sight of the Lord, but Lord, that which is right. Lord, I, I pray that you'll work this in our hearts, and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.